The Old Testament scripture reading today is taken from Psalm 89. I'm going to read for us the first 18 verses of the psalm. You can find it on page 495 of the Pew Bibles if you want to follow along. Hear then the word of the Lord. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crush Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours, The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exult in your name all the day and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted, for our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel." The God we worship is mighty. You see that in this psalm. He is mighty. In fact, he is almighty. One of the names that he gives in Scripture is that he is God almighty. He not only has all power unto himself, but nothing else even compares. And that's the question in a lot of the psalm. Who else compares? Who can compare to the Lord? What about in the heavenly council, it says, the angelic host, the sons of God, or any spiritual beings? No, they don't compare. None is like the Lord our God. And any worship directed toward any lesser being is to worship something and to glory in something that is less glorious. Think, if you will, of of John in the book of Revelation when he encounters an angel near the end of the book and he falls down to worship the angel because the angel does appear glorious to him. But what does the angel say? Don't worship me, right? Worship him. Directs him to worshiping the one who is actually almighty. The question is raised, is any mighty like the Lord our God? No. He rules the sea. The sea in scripture is, is a, a symbol of, of chaos, of the unknown, of that which cannot be controlled. But God is the one who calms it. Think of the Red Sea that he parted, the Leviathan that he tamed. Think of the storm that was raging on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus, with one word, commands it and it stops. Think of where the enemies of our God end up. None can stand against him. All end up being humbled one way or the other. He has all. He owns all. He founded everything. Right? It says that the earth is his, the heavens are his, and the world, the cosmos, all of creation belongs to him because he founded them. Think about what immense power it would take to bring all of creation into existence. 
Think of the, the energy that that would take. And then recognize that God did it with a word. He simply spoke and it was. The arm of the Lord our God is mighty. He's not strong as we measure strength, but so far above and beyond how we measure that nothing compares. What would a a fallen member of the human race be like if they had this kind of might, this kind of power? They would be savage, abusive, corrupt. Right? We say things like, well, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Someone like that, they would use their will and impose it upon others in a way to destroy them, to dominate them. But what do we read about the Lord God Almighty? He's righteous. He's just. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before him. Blessed, it says, are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, in the light of your countenance. That's you. That is you, if you are in Christ, right? Those who know the the festal shout, the, the shout of festivity, of joy, who know all joy and true contentment and happiness because you have all things in Christ. To know that festivity is to know God. This is to be like children who are secure in a strong father. Just like that, you are children of God. You can be secure knowing about his almighty power because his power is used for his good. And if you are his, then for your good as well. Blessed are you then, congregation of Christ. There may be times you feel weak. You feel weak against the the power of sin. You feel weak physically. You feel as though you are weak against the many enemies that arise against the church and seek her harm. But the glory of your strength is the Lord. It's not your strength, but it is, it's his strength. He is the glory of your strength. And who is strong like the Lord God Almighty? Well, we're going to... Our New Testament scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John. We're really going to be focusing on just one particular verse today, but uh, for the sake of context, I'm going to read for us John 20, verse 11 to 18. So be in John chapter 20. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that He had said these things to her. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this morning. We're continuing today uh, our new series on the foundations of the faith. And currently we're working through the statements in the Apostles' Creed. 
today bringing us to the statement, God the Father Almighty. The God that we confess when we confess our faith is the Almighty Father. When we pray to Him, we pray our Father who art in heaven. This is how we know God and how we relate to Him. So what does it mean? Why, why do we call God Father? Why is that? What, what are we supposed to mean by that? Well, there are two ways in which God is Father, both of which are seen in the passage we just read. He is both the Father of the eternal Son of God, and He is the Father of all who believe. He is both the Father of the Lord Jesus and He is your Father if you have been united to Christ by faith. Look again at verse 17. This is where we're going to focus our time. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. I am ascending to my Father and your Father. We see here that there is a, a similarity, while also a distinction. He's my Father and your Father. Jesus didn't say, I am ascending to our Father. And I think that actually does matter. Not because it'd be wrong to say our Father in a certain sense, but because there is a distinction here between the relationship of Christ to the Father and our relationship to Him. We have been made participants in the second person of the Trinity and His relationship to the Father, but in such a way that it's still clear that He is the eternally begotten, the only begotten, as Scripture says. He is the only begotten Son of the Father. We are adopted co-heirs that have been brought into the family of God. So, Congregation of Christ, this is what I want you to hear today as we we look at these and other words in the Scripture. I want you to hear that glorious truth that you have a Father in heaven, the one who is the Father Almighty. And I want you to be able to rest secure knowing of His love for you as He has loved His only begotten Son. So he has loved you. So we're going to take this in two then. We're going to look first at the way in which God is Father, eternally speaking, before all creation, being Father of the Son, and then also how he is Father of many sons, us included. The Father is the Father because he has a Son. He is an eternal Father because he has an eternal Son. And meditate on that for a moment. These are things that we just, we know, we talk about, we maybe discuss some. But God is eternally Father. Sometimes we think that God calls himself a Father in Scripture because it will make him more understandable to us. That it's simply some kind of analogy or it's a linguistic convention to communicate something about him to us. But that's actually not how it works. God is Father, Son, and Spirit. He is Father as He has a Son. The way it really works is that fathers on earth are a reflection of His fatherhood. There are fathers in creation because He is a Father. We read this in Ephesians 3, 14 to 15. The Apostle Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And the word for family is the same word for father. comes from the same word. That every fatherhood, every father gets its name. Fatherhood is not then simply a convention. It's not something that can be useful, but it's not necessary. It's actually fundamental to the framework of creation because God is a father. And all of creation is reflecting the glory of the father. So before anything was, there was the father. 
The relationship of the Son to the Father is distinct from a, a purely human relationship because Jesus was not just the Son in a conventional way of speaking. Or he was not just the Son in that, that God adopted him into his family. He really was and is the eternally begotten, the eternally generated Son of God. This point is made throughout the Gospel of John. And my intention is that next year, I think that this series that we're in will probably take us through the year. As far as I've mapped it out, that, that looks to be the case. But starting next year, I'd like to go through the Gospel of John. That may change. Don't hold me to it. But if we do that, maybe this will be a little bit of a, a foretaste for you. Throughout the Gospel of John, it, it speaks of this relationship between the Son and the Father. In the beginning, it starts, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. So Jesus is the only Son the Word who is God is the only Son. The story of the Gospel is a story that began then before creation, as God planned redemption in order to show forth His almighty power and His righteousness and His mercy. The Son comes to do the will of the Father and so redeem for Himself a people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What does it say? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So the father sends the son into the world because he was seeking those who would worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus says repeatedly throughout this gospel, that he can only do what the, he sees the Father doing first, that he and the Father are one, that the Son makes known the will of the Father. He says that as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So when Jesus says, I am ascending to my Father, there's all of this backdrop of the relationship that he has to the Father. He didn't become the Son of God by doing the right thing. He wasn't made the Son of God. He is the Son of God from eternity past, always has been, and always will be. And if you simply scan through, if you just took your Bibles right now, and you just scan through the Gospel of John, on almost every page, it will stick out to you that Jesus is saying something about the Father. All the time, he's speaking about the Father and about the relationship that he has to the Father. All the way through the Gospel, he is making this known. He's revealing it. We learn something of this relationship that they have, of the union of God the Father and the Son. They are distinct and yet fully united. In John 17, in the garden, Jesus is praying, and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. You see the, the, the reciprocity of the relationship. Glorify me, that I may glorify you. He keeps going. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He continues, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you, that's us, those who would come to believe through the word of the apostles. I do not ask only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That union that they have together is made known. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. So when Jesus is speaking about ascending to the Father, he's speaking of this Father, of his Father, the Father Almighty. And when we confess 
the Father. We're speaking of this Father. The Father of the eternal Son of God. The one who is Father. However, it doesn't stop there for us. That isn't all we mean. That's the most important. That is the, the fundamental truth. Because this is who God is. Right? The primary purpose of all things. Of each one of your lives. Is to glorify the one who is. And he is Father. So we, we glorify him as such. So that, that is fundamental. That is the most important thing. That God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That matters more than anything else. Because everything else that we're going to say flows out of that glorious truth. Everything else shines in the light of that glorious reality. But the blessing for you who are in Christ Jesus is that that Father is your Father. The Father of the Lord Jesus is your Father as well. He's your Father and you are His sons. Jesus says, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father. It was said right from the beginning that this was God's plan. The Son would come and draw all peoples to Himself. And they would be children of the Most High. As we already read, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of the Most High. It goes on, it says that they had the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So you can be a child of God. You can be a son of God. You can be born again and adopted into his family. Not one of us will have the the exact relationship that Christ did to the Father because he is the only son of God. But the, the miracle of the incarnation... The miracle of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is that in his work, by his work, and now by the the spirit that dwells within you, you have been brought into that relationship. You have been brought into relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. So you have a Father. We recently uh, finished a series through Romans. You remember what Romans says in Romans 8 about being adopted into his family. It says this, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. The Father sent the Son. The Father and Son sent the Spirit. And that Spirit now dwells in you if you believe. And He is the true Spirit of adoption, it says. Right? The, the Spirit of God within you testifies to the fact that you have a Father in heaven. That you are His. That you are a part of His family. How can this be? Well, you've been made a partaker of the divine nature. This is what Peter says. That by union with Christ, you can now come to the Father in a way that was not possible apart from Christ. You are the body of Christ. That's how how united you are to him, that you corporately can be called the body of Christ. He being your head. You mystically partake in his body and blood. You're made participants in it, we're told. Where he goes, you go. And so we're told that you are seated with him in the heavenly places. That the the union you have with Christ is much like what we were just reading about. Right? You in me and I in you. So too, Christ by his spirit dwells in you. And you, by that Spirit, dwell with Him. 
If you abide in him, if you are united to him, then you have received the love of the Father. A love that abides. Right? Christ prayed this in what we were just reading. He goes on to say that, that the love with which you, the Father, have loved me, the Son, may be in them. And I in them. To believe in Christ is to be a child of God. It is to know more and more the love of God, the same love with which he has loved the Son. And did you notice how Jesus speaks to Mary when he speaks to the disciples, when he's, he's sending her to the disciples to go and tell them of his resurrection? How did he refer to them? He says, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers. He doesn't say go to my servants, which would be fine for him to say. He doesn't say go to my, my disciples, which would have been perfectly fine to say. We know it's speaking of the disciples. He says go to my brothers. And we sometimes use the, the phrase child of God to describe all people. Sometimes it's used that way, right? We're, we're all children of God, we might say, something like that. That's not quite right. That's not quite true. In a sense, it is because God is the creator of all things, all people, right? All are made in his image. And in that sense, all, all come from him, uh, right? There, there's a sense in which you could say that. But when we're talking about the, the children of God here, when we talk about becoming sons of God, in, in the deepest sense, God is Father to Jesus Christ. And so to be his son, to be his child, is only for those who are in him. All who are in Christ. All who are made to be sons like he is. All who have been adopted into the family of God. All who are not just made in the image of God, as all mankind is, but also those who have been renewed after the image of the Son. All who have been given the spirit of adoption. That's who are the children of God. Adoption is what God has done by bringing you out of darkness into his family. You were outside of his family, in other words. You were outside of his love and fatherly care. But in Christ, you have been brought in. If you have believed, you are part of the family of God. And you've been marked with a new name, with the name of Jesus Christ. And you've been covered by his blood. So in name and in blood, you are God's family. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, says at one point that if you were to try to sum up the whole message of the scripture into just three words, the way he would do it would be to say, adoption by propitiation. Right? That by the death of Christ, to satisfy the wrath of God, we have been adopted into the family of God. Jesus was the firstborn and only begotten son. But he came in order that God would have more children. He came that he might, in the words of Hebrews, bring many sons to glory. That was why he came. The firstborn among many brothers. Jesus Christ was the firstborn among many. God the Father then is your Father. Because he is the father of the son of God. This is why it matters that we start with the eternal relationship between God the father and the son. Because that is the, the means by which you can be brought into his family. By being united to his son. He is your father because he is the father of Jesus Christ. I am ascending, Christ said, to my father and to your father. To my God and to your God. Congregation of Christ, I want you to understand that, that God is not some force. 
He's not some life force. He's not some kind of arbitrary will or arbitrary power. That's not what God is or what he is like. His might, his power is at work glorifying the Son because he is a father. And in him, in the Son, he is bringing many sons into his glory. His fatherhood then is not just a convention of speech, but rather it's, it's deeply revealing something about who he is. Who he is is a father. And because he's a father, he can be your father. And if you have not known him, if you have not come to know God the Father, the way is through Jesus Christ. The way is through the Son. And if you believe in him, then you will be adopted into his family. Then you will have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you, testifying to the fact that you are his. In a sense, his blood running through your veins. Now, if you have known him, if you have come to know the God and Father through Jesus Christ the Son, then it's fitting that you glory in that. Right? When we read about the festal shout in, in Psalm 89, right? the, the, the shout of joy, of, of festivity, right? of celebration, you can do that because you have a Father in heaven. Right? You can glory in that fact. Glory in the fact of your Father. You have a protector and a defender. Right? He is a good father. He's not like a father who fails you. He's not like a father here on earth that might be uh, abusive or negligent or distant. That's not what God the Father is like. We're told what he is like. And we're told by the relationship that he has to the son. No, he is a defender and protector. That's what you have in the father. You have an almighty God who loves you, right? Not a God who is distant, but a God because he is a father who cares for you, who loves you, who even likes you, right? Who enjoys you. Think about how God the father is spoken of toward how he sees his only son, Jesus Christ. That is how he sees you if you have been united to Christ. If you are in him, that is how God the Father looks upon you. You have a father who loves you, who cares for you, who embraces you as his son. As father, he is do your reverence and your respect, your honor. And as his child you have a right to all the privileges that come along with that. You are, as it says, a co-heir with Christ. So you share in the inheritance with the eternal Son of God. Therefore, you have all things in Him. This is the Father that you have, and this is what we mean. When we confess together, when we, we confess our faith, that we believe in God, the Father Almighty. This is what we mean. Would you pray with me? Father God, we pray that you would reveal yourself through your word, that you would make known your love for us, and that as we have heard your word now, that you would not allow our various sins and insecurities and misunderstandings to get in the way of what you are speaking, but rather you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to receive what it is that you have spoken about yourself here in your word. We ask, Lord, that we would know you as our Father, that those who do not know you would come to know you as a Father. And that we would not in pride think that our 
sins make us unlovable to you, but rather we would know that by faith in your Son and having been united to him, your love to us, in us, is the love that you have for your Son, is the love that you had for the Lord Jesus, your love in him, in us. Help us, Father, have mercy upon us to know these things in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to prepare now.